recording. Hello, listeners, wherever you are, and welcome to Fix This Flick, a podcast where two self-appointed movie critics deconstruct your favorite movies and tell you how we'd make them better. I'm your host, Ali, and I'm joined this time by a new guest host, Emmy. Hello. Welcome, Emmy. Thank you so much for coming to the pod. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. You actually have been pestering me for quite a while to get on the podcast, haven't you? For this specific movie. (laughs) And what movie would that be? Twilight, the first one in the saga. You wanted to do all five, but I managed to negotiate you down to the first one. I've actually seen all five. I don't think I can do I can do that again, but I did rewatch the first one. So for this episode, we'll be fixing one of the biggest pop culture phenomenons of the last 20 years, Twilight. You're impossibly fast and strong. You gotta give me some answers. I'd rather hear your theories. I have considered radioactive spiders and kryptonite. It's all superhero stuff, right? What if I'm not the hero? What if I'm the bad guy? I know what you are. Your skin is hell white and ice cool. You don't go out into the sunlight. Say it out loud. Say it. Vampire. Are you afraid? No. This isn't real. This kind of stuff just doesn't exist. It does in my world. I just want to try one thing. I don't know how long I've waited for you. What is going on? Security guard at the mill got killed by some kind of animal. An animal? My family, we're different from others of our kind. You brought a snack. What, now he's coming after me? The hunt is his obsession. He's never gonna stop. I'd rather die than to stay away from you. He's got unparalleled senses, absolutely lethal. I'll do whatever it takes to make you safe again. (laughs) You're faster than the others. But not stronger. I'm strong enough to kill you. You are my life now. When 17-year-old Bella, played by Kristen Stewart, moves to a new town, she finds herself intensely drawn to a reclusive boy in her high school. But Edward, played by Robert Pattinson, is not what he appears to be. He's a vampire, but the good kind of vampire that sparkles for some reason, can read minds, and is handsome in a pale, pasty, off-putting kind of way. For reasons unclear to me, anyway, romance blossoms between the two, but when Edward reveals his secret and allows Bella to enter his life, she falls into mortal danger that can only be resolved by one of the most underwhelming movie climaxes of all time. Based on a young adult book series written by Stephanie Meyer, Twilight the Movie was an instant hit when it came out in 2008. The success of the first Twilight movie spawned four additional movies and a new book that came out last year, showing the same events as the first book, except from Edward's perspective. I read it, and I enjoyed it. Oh yeah, would you recommend the book? If you like the series. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) okay. It's a big if. (laughs) So why was Twilight such a massive hit? Does this movie have Mormon subliminal messaging in it? How could anything not be a better love story than Twilight? We'll answer these questions and more as we talk about what worked for us in Twilight and what didn't, and think of a few things that might improve it. And then we'll pass our final judgment on whether Twilight is fixable, just fine as it is, or damaged beyond repair. And as always, spoiler alert from here on out. So, Emmy, I should mention at this point to our listeners that you are a huge fan of the Twilight Saga. Is this I correct? I am. The books and the movies. 
Well, what would you say are better, the books or the movies? Definitely the books. That's often the case, isn't it? Yes, yeah. almost always. <laughs> so like for me, just a kind of as an outsider, I remember when the Twilight movies came out, and I don't really remember when the books came out, but I remember feeling confused by why it was so popular. I did end up watching the first movie many years ago, and <laughs> the first impression I had of it was, wow, this is really boring. Why is this so popular? There's like no chemistry between the two main main leads. Over the years, I kind of avoided anything Twilight related. And I just felt like there were so many things that were better than it that did exact same thing. Like um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, there's that whole Buffy and Angel thing. Even something like True Blood that was on HBO a while back. And so I never really had any interest in revisiting it until you came along into my life. <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious to know why did you want to talk about well, you wanted to talk about all five Twilight movies, but why did you want to talk about Twilight? I think for me, I was a big fan of it because I was like a preteen when the movies came out and when I read the books. So it was like my first taste of young adult books, of romance books, even just like supernatural books. And I think that's the case for a lot of people that really like the saga. I think the majority of the fans of it are within five years of my age. I think it was different from other books or movies that were like supernatural romances at the time because the way that the characters are set in the plot, it's a very normal town. Like There isn't stuff happening. There isn't people going missing all the time until the first movie. I think other, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and other series like that, there's stuff that's happening constantly in the town that makes you be like how aren't people realizing that it's more fantastical yeah there's fantasy stuff happening that other people are witnessing whether they know that it's vampires so, or whatever so what you're telling me is people were drawn to twilight because it was more grounded in reality <laughs> in a sense <laughs> okay i can kind of see what you're saying just from watching the first movie it's very bland it's very it's like intentionally shot in this very nothing stands out kind of way. So she just moves to this new town and new high school. I think what it was is she left her mom because her mom wanted to travel. Yeah. Her and so mom, she went to stay with her dad and her parents are divorced. Yeah. Her mom was wanting to travel with her new boyfriend who's a, in quotes, professional baseball player. Yeah. They don't really explain anything <laughs> more than that. I think there's like a scene in the movie where she's in a batting cage and that's as far as we get yeah. to seeing what that is. So she moves in with her dad, who she only visited for a couple weeks in the summer her whole life. And he's a cop. Not that that really matters. He is a cop. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like the only cop in that town. Are there other cops that we see? Well, it's like a small town, right? It is. Yeah. Very it's small. a small town in Washington. Mm -hmm. And so she basically moves from, I think there's a thematic significance to this. She moves from Phoenix, which is one of the hottest, sunniest places yeah. in America. And she goes to the state of Washington to a town that's in the, the wettest yeah. and cloudiest place. And that's important because the vampires <laughs> in this mythology of vampires sparkle in sunlight. Yes. Essentially, that's all you really need to know to just get introduced to the story. She moves. She's a new person in town. She's supposedly presented as a misfit, a loner, but she makes friends very easily <laughs> without any challenges. And like a bunch of boys are interested in her, but she's drawn to this one boy. Edward, at some point when they're actually talking to each other, says that everything about him is designed to draw her to him because he's the ultimate predator. Yeah. I would say the first hour of the movie, not much happens beyond she likes him, but he's avoiding her. And then he saves her life using his vampire superpowers. And she won't leave him alone. She wants to find out the secret behind him. And he is avoiding her, but he still wants her. Like there's this like where he, he wants her, but he, just, he shouldn't kind of thing. I pretty much just summarized the first hour of the movie right there, didn't I? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so... I guess my first kind of question for you is, because you read the books, what I felt watching the movie is it was unclear to me why they're drawn to each other beyond just saying, you know, chemistry or love at first sight. I don't know, like some kind of explanation like that or some immortal soulmates. And of course, they're going to be drawn to each other. But I was wondering if the books go into a little bit more of what they liked about each other. I think with the books, there's a lot of stuff that is relevant that's not included in the movies. But the books explain, and the movie kind of explains as well, that these all these vampires, all of the Cullens, are these beautiful, gorgeous people that like everybody has a crush on, everyone's attracted to them, because they're just so 
pretty. And so obviously Bella notices them. But with Edward, he can read minds. He can read everybody's mind, except he can't read Bella's. For reasons that they don't explain. They never really explain. Okay. <laughs> well, because they're immortal soulmates or something. Yeah. So yeah. he can't read her mind and that intrigues him on top of her scent. <laughs> Yeah, so, she has a very appealing scent yes. for, for all... For, do they explain why her scent is so appealing? No. Okay, it just is? It just is. So I would say the first major incident is he saves her life. There's a there's a van coming in at high speed and she's going to get killed, basically. It's just in the school parking lot. And in the last moment, he rushes in with his super speed and stops the, the van. So begins her pursuit of what he is. And he doesn't do a very good job of covering it up he says oh it's an adrenaline rush look it up on google i think that's like an exact line from the movie yeah. um so at this point i should also mention that especially in the first 20 to 30 minutes i felt that a lot of the dialogue felt very unnatural and movie like the first movie comes off as like a pilot episode to like a show like where the talking's not quite set and the characters haven't really figured themselves out yet and it's just starting but the whole movie is like that. But I think that that's something that as much as it's this worldwide phenomenon, it's like kind of like a cult classic, especially the first movie. People like that about it, that it's kind of cringy, that there's like new stuff put in the movie that are not lines that are just like absurd. <laughs> <laughs> like, like what's one example? <laughs> Hold on tight, spider monkey, and he yeah. jumps out the window. Oh. Or Bella, where the hell have you been, loca? <laughs> I don't even remember that. Part. Oh my god, I must have blanked that out. I see what you mean. Like it, it's it does have that pilot vibe. To the question I had earlier to you, I just don't feel like we have enough information in the movie to understand why they are drawn to each other. So I wish there was more of a backstory on Bella to understand what she's like and what her motivations are and why she would be wanting someone like Edward in her life. Well, we understand in the opening narration, which is terrible, by the way, is just <laughs> it's like, this is Charlie. He's my dad. He's a police. <laughs> he's a police chief. It's just so matter of fact about everything. I'm moving to a new town. It's called Forks, Washington. Population and blah, blah, blah. I wish we had gotten a sense of what her life was like, what her past relationships with boys were like, because to me, she seemed... A bit sullen, not depressed necessarily, but sullen, withdrawn, not really excited by anything, not really excited by this move, not really excited by anything in life. And we just don't know why. And then this guy comes along and why is she drawn to him? Because he's good looking? Is that really all there is to it? Because she notices there's something different about him? So I feel like if we knew more about her past, maybe she had issues with a boyfriend or she was really lonely i don't know there's nothing to go on here do you know what i mean like is there stuff in the in the book that they could have inserted into the movie about this yeah that's what my first fix is there's so much stuff in the books because it's such a long series and then they have the adaptations afterwards like midnight sun being from edward's perspective they have life and death which is just a gender bent twilight they have little novellas that come off of it so the the whole universe of Twilight is very in-depth. There's the illustrated guide after that you're supposed to read after the books to have even more information about that. Oh my god. But if you take if you took the context of the books, knowing that watching the movie, you would understand more about the characters and I think they lacked including that or even showing it in subtle ways. Like Bella's whole personality is this super mature, like she doesn't want to be in her high school anymore because she did AP before and knows it all and she doesn't need to live with her parents because she just looks she after can take herself. Care of herself. And the reason for that that they clearly explain in the books and not at all in the movie is that Renee, her mom, was just this like off in the wind all the time, left Bella alone for weeks. Bella like looked after herself from the time she was like seven years old. The only reason that she's moving in with Charlie, her dad, is because Renee felt bad leaving Bella alone. So Bella said, oh, I'll just go live with dad then. Like Renee was just going to leave her teenage daughter alone for a year to live. And Bella was like, I don't want her to feel bad about it. So I'm going to go find like live with my dad. So she's always putting her mom before her and it's more of like Bella's the parent to her own mother. 
for her whole life. And so that's why she's portrayed like that. Is this person that's like really disinterested in the teenage stuff. And they lack including that. The other thing I was going to mention about context that's lacked in the book is like... Lacked in the movie, you mean? Yeah, lacked in the movie, sorry. Is anything in their relationship. They have like four minutes of conversation throughout the whole movie. Edward and Bella? Yeah, combined... They're is it really that little? Barely talking to each other. And they meet like three times and like months are passing in between this. This whole movie takes place over like one school year. So my sense is then that she she was someone who was bored and ready to just like leave this stage of high school behind and looking for the next, I guess, adventure. I don't know. Would that be a fair way of describing it? I don't know if she's a very adventurous. No, she isn't. I guess she becomes adventurous with this new guy. So maybe yeah. it's something she's looking for. Because they didn't know how the movie was going to turn out. I think they were expecting that a lot of the people that were going to be watching it were just people that had already read the book, which is a majority of the people that did go and see it. So they it. don't have to bother wasting their time explaining the backstories because the, they, they assume the, the viewers already know it. They definitely should have explained it, or at least the people that are relevant in the first movie. There needs to be more between her and Edward. There's so much in the book of romance and them going out and doing stuff and having conversations and laughing with each other like they joke with each other and they are funny well, well, but it's not <laughs> in the movie let, let me ask you like what's like one thing from the book like particularly between edward and bella when they're first you know courting each other whatever you want to call it that you think should have been in the movies like one thing in particular that stands out there's a whole chapter the fifth chapter of the first book it's called blood type it's biology class where they first sit beside each other don't they have that in the movie oh that's a the first day but this is like a week later after he's gone for that week after he almost kills her after he almost kills her remember she walks in and the fan blows and they used to cover his mouth because she smells so good oh okay he almost eats her there (laughs) okay anyway continue yeah so in this chapter of the book they're doing blood types in biology class they're pricking their fingers and they're figuring out what their blood type is and you have Bella walk in and the teacher's doing a demonstration and pricks Jessica's finger and Bella smells the blood and is like immediately going to be sick. She needs to leave. So Mike, her the blonde guy who has a big crush on her, is helping her to the office, to the nurse's office. And Edward's heard Mike's thoughts because he's creeping on Bella in all of her classes through her friend's thoughts. Um... <laughs> He hears Mike's thoughts and shows up there and tells Mike, oh, it's fine. I've got her. So he takes her into the nurse's office and they're talking. And Edward's like really taken aback that Bella can smell blood. Because apparently humans aren't supposed to be able to smell blood. And it's just this really funny scene where they're interacting and someone else gets sick in the class and comes in and Edward hears them coming before they're there and tells Bella to go away because she's going to be sick again. And it's just this whole debacle. It's just completely missing in the movie. Yeah, and it's just not there at all. And it's just a really interesting chapter where you learn some stuff about Bella and you see before Edward's really prominent in her life how much he's watching her and like cares about her and is jealous of other people in her life like Mike. Oh, yeah, you don't get that at all in the movie, like the jealousy. like totally blows them off, like doesn't even think of them as competition at all in the movie. But he is from the start of the book in Twilight and in Midnight Sun, where it's from his perspective, which is a really interesting side of it because you can see everything that's happening in everyone's mind when Bella's around. He's jealous of when guys talk to her or he's really defensive if somebody is like slightly mean to her or talks in like a condescending tone that even she doesn't pick up but he does. He's very overbearing. So so why does he let's go into like the bit, bit of the mystique of Edward. What is something they could have then shown to explain why he finds her so in, like interesting? He's just she's just like a unique human being. She she can smell blood and he can't read her thoughts. Is there anything else that he likes about her that, that could have been in the movie? It's explained very well in the books that he just thinks that she's gorgeous. Okay. And that when he hears the thoughts of other people that 
especially girls who are like, I don't understand why all these guys are talking about her. He's like, what do they mean? Like, she's beautiful. Why wouldn't they be talking about her? He just thinks that, like, it's like basically love at first sight for both of them. Okay. I, I guess the movie does kind of show that when they're like just looking at each other. So maybe that, maybe I'll accept that. <laughs> But I do agree with you that a couple more scenes between the two of them together sh should have been done because that's the most important thing in the movie. Yeah. So here's my suspicion that the movie makers felt that, okay, we have two hours to make this movie. We can't include everything in the book. So <laughs> let's just emphasize everything about Bella and Edward and everybody else is expendable. With the relationship of the mother, you don't know anything. No. You don't know anything. She, she likes her mother and her mother is away. That's all you know. And her dad, she doesn't know him as well, but she loves him. And, and that's pretty much it. He's completely absent. And I get it. Sometimes there's parents who are absent, uh, even though even if they care and they and they love. I think she says in the movie that I like that he doesn't hover. But we can still have, we can still see that. We just, I, I mean, he's just literally absent. There might have been an opportunity to show more of the friction between the two of them. Like maybe they have an argument. Like maybe this is kind of a cliched thing to do that maybe he doesn't like Edward and doesn't like his influence on her life when they do start seeing each other. I don't know, something. And beyond her relationship with her dad, I wish there was more friction or conflict in her day-to-day -day life like maybe she needs a, a job to cover the cost of something or you said she wants to be independent and just move on already she did all her classes maybe she's trying to get into university somewhere and she's getting this part-time job to cover the tuition and i don't know you know things going on in her life outside of this guy or things that kind of inform us of what she's like she's diligent she's hard working she's something in, in the movie she's not a big people person and She's nice. That's really it. And a question for you then is, I've heard this theory that the reason why Bella's character is like this is because it will be easier for readers to insert themselves into her role. Do you think that's the case? I do. I heard that Stephanie Meyer, her whole plot for this book was made from a dream where she was the character. She was Bella. So Bella is a self-insert character. You're supposed to be able to put yourself there or Stephanie Meyer was putting herself there. I think that that is something that people do really like about it because she is so nondescript that you can just place yourself into that world. Seems like it would be a good idea for like a theme park or a video game, but for a movie where you're... I mean, like if you think about the most popular characters, they're ones who have very clear personality traits, very clear things driving them and interesting quirks. And what you were telling me as well before we were recording is that there's actually a lot of like a, a lack of representation in the world of the movie and is it just the movie or is it the books as well the books as well so you have laurent who's a who's black yeah. and he's one of the vampires who are the villains of this movie we're going to talk about the villains in a bit they're kind of mentioned here and there briefly there's basically just this group of vampires who aren't with the Collins that are killing people in the area and they're not really a presence until later on so we'll save that but so you have laurent and tyler the guy who almost hits her with the van Tyler, and then I think there's another guy who's Asian who has a crush on her, Eric, too. yeah. Okay. So there's so. three people of color aside from the Kiluat tramp. Yeah. I, I'd say, actually, now that you mentioned that this, the, this movie has way more people of color than most <laughs> movies, <laughs> wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree? Maybe if you don't include the fact that the star that's supposed to be Native American is not. Taylor Lautner is not Native American, but they casted him to play him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's three people of color, two black men. This is where Stephanie Meyer's writing really shows her background. She grew up What Mormon. is her background? She's Mormon. <laughs> In interesting. Okay. So she grew up Mormon in a Mormon area with Mormon people. <laughs> so in the books, Laurent is not black. Really? Nope. Oh. Everyone is white. Everybody is white. And the reason that Laurent is black and Tyler is black and Eric is Asian is that the director, she really wanted to diversify the movie. So all those characters you just mentioned are not... No. They're just all white. Yeah. The and the director, Catherine Hardwick, she really wanted to, she wanted to have uh, different ethnicities within the Cullens clan. She wanted Alice to be Japanese, but Stephanie Myers, because she was on set and 
she was really pushing back against that. I think mostly because she had it in her head how these people looked and who they were and she knew them so well herself in her mind that she just didn't want anything changed. But the director originally wanted it to be really diverse cast. One of the things that I find really strange, it's kind of eerie. So in the illustrated guide, which is the afterthought book that explains more. Stephanie Meyer writes this part about the transformation between human and vampire where regardless of your ethnicity when you become a vampire all the pigment is drained from your skin so you turn white (laughs) (laughs) so she says that even the darkest of skin will only be a faint olive after the transformation really yeah so that's already strange but it's even stranger when you read these quotes from Mormon officials or from religious texts where they state that having dark skin is a curse from God. And as you accept the gospel, you lighten. So is the equivalent then like when you become a vampire, you accept the gospel? It seems like it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Wow. I had no idea. To the whole Mormon angle, this was something I didn't really know about until more recently that this movie is Mormon propaganda more or less and I figured you know more about it than I do what I understood was that the whole thing about how so their relationship is developing and their boyfriend and girlfriend now and she figures out he's a vampire through a very cringy mo- like montage of her looking things up and words like immortal <laughs> vampire, <Googling> vampire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she figures out he's a vampire and he lets her into his life and they start dating. So here's the theory I heard that he, not so much in this movie, but in the later movies, he refuses to have sex with her because he's afraid he's going to hurt her. Or no, no, it's more that he doesn't want to turn her into a vampire, which is uh, something she starts asking him about because she wants to be with him forever and he doesn't want to. And so that's supposed to be a metaphor for not defiling a girl before marriage. Is that correct? That makes sense. They also don't have sex until marriage in the later movies. Movies, yeah. I think that her Mormon influence is like seen throughout the movie in like everything, fashion choices, especially in the book are described. There's this one infamous scene where Bella's going to meet the Cullens and she wears this long sleeve blue blouse and a long khaki skirt and Edward says she looks utterly indecent. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't make the cut for the movie. Sadly, no. <laughs> I, I will say that is something I did like about the movie. She is not sexualized whatsoever. No. I can't even think of a single thing she wore. Like her clothing wasn't important. It was more just the relationship between the two of them. Yeah. So that is a a plus, I would say. Yeah, it's very romance based. I think that that kind of benefited her in the long run with the books and the movies because it's her writing about potentially herself as a insert character, but it probably was written for adults. But it was a YA book because it's so PG-13. There's no sex. There's no making out. There's nothing. So it broadened the horizon of who enjoys it and who's allowed to enjoy it. Kids can read it. Their parents are okay with them seeing it. Old ladies want to read it. Even like a young child. I don't know how young you want to go. Like I think I could see like a young child, like a 12-year-old or 11-year-old watching the movie, the first Twilight movie and being okay. Like the most intense part is maybe that one is jumping ahead, but like there's a character whose head is torn off and then thrown into a fire. But even then you can't really tell what's going on. Yeah. I read the books when I was eight and I loved them. <laughs> okay. So that could probably explain some of the mass appeal of it as well. It just isn't tainted by all that nasty, dirty <laughs> sex stuff. Because she was Mormon, I didn't know that. That could explain also her... I'm going to assume ignorance of Native American culture. I think it can explain it, but it's easy enough to research when, especially when you're writing a book that involves it, you should be doing the research to like accurately be describing things. Yeah. (laughs) So, so for listeners who aren't aware uh, or haven't heard the expressions or the terms team Jacob and team Edward, (laughs) So there's another character who's a pretty prominent one in all of the movies, not so much in this one. It's clearly that they're building something up. There's Jacob, 
who's Native American, and he lives in a reservation that's somewhere near the town where Bella lives. She's known him since she was a little girl. Well, here's the mystery to me. Okay, so why did she include this then? I read... From, to be like from like a reservation or like a tribe. I read that adding Jacob into the book and creating a love triangle was like a really last minute thought when she was writing Twilight. She was writing Twilight and it got picked up by a publisher and then they asked her for more books afterwards and she had to like think of a way to extend the series. It makes sense to have a love triangle in this kind of stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. But why did Jacob have to be Native American? I also understand why he was a werewolf so that this whole Native... Could you even say that that's maybe a bit racist? That the, the Native Americans are just like yeah. wild, uncontrollable werewolves? Yeah, it's pretty taboo. I think that a big issue with both the books and the movies was that she took this folklore and like bastardized it from the clan being from the wolf clan to the... Because the wolf has a lot of significance for a lot of tribes, right? Yeah, and it's this like ancient folklore of theirs of there being like this split... And she bastardized it and turned it into, they're all werewolves and they hate the vampires, which is another strange kind of Mormon thing that goes to the point before. When talking about the dark skin being tainted, the Mormon church was normally talking about indigenous people. And she added them into her book and made them the rivals of the vampire. And they can never be vampires because they're werewolves. Okay, you can interpret what, <laughs> quite a bit from there. Oh my god. <laughs> so all of this context is kind of just bubbling under the surface of this story. And Bella and Edward are together. He did a, he did a couple of kind of creepy stalkery things with her where he's just following her around and he feel, yeah sleeping. watching her. But you know, that's the kind of stuff that's just romantic in movies, <laughs> apparently. But what happens is they go for like a friendly little baseball game. The baseball scene in Twilight should be watched. You mentioned that some people like watching Twilight because it's it's cringily bad. Yeah. I think the baseball scene has to be one of the top. It's one of people's favorite scenes. I, I, it's hard to explain it. It's something that you just have to watch. They're just the, the, the choice of music. I think it's Muse yeah. of all things. <laughs> Speaking of music, they're, they're, like, there's a Radiohead song at the end. It's so bizarre. Like, the music choices. Where, where did this come from? I don't know. Anyway. But they got so many big bands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, so there, it's a, a thunderstorm, which is the only time they can play baseball because they whack the ball so hard that it sounds like thunder and that covers <laughs> it up. And everything is going well. And the characters are doing very lame things left and right. I The thing I think is the funniest is how... Is it Alice? Yeah. She's the pitcher. She has this pitching technique that, again, I can't it describe like it. It looks like a dance. It looks like a dance. It's clear that she doesn't know what the hell she's doing, but whatever. Anyway, so while they're doing this game, those other vampires have been killing people come. Laurent and two others, James and Victoria. Very important characters in this movie because they're the main villains who we know nothing about beyond their sadistic and they like killing people and they notice that bella is there and james decides you know what i'm i want bella because he realizes how much edward is protective of her my best guest is, sorry my best guess is james is just really bored and looking for a challenge and he thinks edward is a challenge so he's gonna try and kill the thing that's most important to him is that what it essentially is from the books so the books explain that James is a tracker. So his whole thing is like when he finds like a target, he's tracking it down until he kills it. So he picks Bella because she smells so good because the wind comes in and blows her hair around. But what do you mean he's a tracker? Like, is it like he must be like genetically a tracker it's or is like, it that he was trained to be one or he just likes the role? Which, which thing is it? It's like his special power. Like how Edward can read minds and Jasper can manipulate people's emotions. And Alice can see the future. Yep. Yeah. James, it tracks very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's just, uh, I, I kind of find it funny how it's not enough that they're vampires. They also have to have all these special abilities. And that that's just that the way it is, right? They each get one special ability. But only some vampires. Oh, not all of them no. get special abilities. Okay. When I was asking you this earlier before we were recording, you, you said that there was some sort of backstory between James and Edward. So similar to what I was saying about how, as a fix, we should have more of a backstory for, for Bella to understand why she wanted Edward and what's going on in her life. 
the villains have no backstory whatsoever. We know nothing about James. It's so funny, actually, that the actor who plays James, he, he, I think he became a much bigger star after this movie. He does nothing in this movie. He's, I, I think it's not an exaggeration to say he's in six scenes, maybe? Yeah, because even, like, everything in between when he sees her to when he has her, he's not really He's not there. involved, yeah, we don't Unless see him. Unless it's, like, a flashing scene of him running. I think we, he, we see him briefly watching her go to her dad's house. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. So what is the backstory? Is there a backstory for him connecting him to Edward? So the connection between the Cullens and James is not James and Edward. It's James and Alice. But because in the movie, we don't know. Alice is such an irrelevant character. Yeah, Yeah. we don't know her backstory at all. And she has a really tragic kind of horrific one that isn't explained until the illustrated guide and midnight sun alice was found in a hole that someone had dug and put her in after she had been changed into a vampire oh so carlisle didn't turn her into a vampire. no somebody else does and they don't know who who did it she has almost no memories of before she was turned but it explains that she was in a mental asylum because of her seeing the future they put her away so she could see the future before she became a vampire yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Which is something else that's talked about in the book. People or the vampires will change people that they can see have some sort of gift. Ah, uh, But gotcha. sometimes it's also just an accident. Like Carlisle didn't know that Edward could hear thoughts until Edward started answering Carlisle's questions that he wasn't asking. He was oh, just thinking. Okay, and Carlisle is just like the patriarch of the Cullens, right? Yeah. Like he's the one who takes care of all of them, is yeah. older than all of them? Okay. So James killed Alice's, the vampire that turned her, and made her be left alone in this hole because the vampire was going to stay with her, obviously. He hadn't killed her. He was keeping her. But James kills him. And then she's left in this hole for who knows how long. I guess she could get out if she really wanted to. (laughs) (laughs) So she just stays in the hole? Okay. This is just like making me think of more questions. Anyway... Um, so Alice was his original prey that he had been tracking. In the baseball scene, he doesn't even notice Alice. And the only reason that we know about this later in Midnight Sun is that Edward's reading his thoughts and realizes that James didn't notice Alice until he was leaving. But he had already set his sights on Bella. Is James the main villain of the first book? Yeah. Okay, so... I think this is a flaw in both the book and the movie. His main connection is just with Alice, who's a secondary character. I feel like, as a fix, maybe for the book as well, the connection should have been between James and Edward in some way. Maybe they have some sort of grudge or they have some sort of history together. And that's why James is so motivated to do this. Because from my perspective, sure, he's a tracker, but it seems like he's just, okay, now I decided to do this, which is, it makes sense. But I feel like it doesn't have much impact or thematic value in the movie because in the movie, all it is is Edward brings Bella into his life and that brings her into danger. Yeah. And it's it's not even done in an interesting way. He just brings her to a baseball game and they show up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it really is. Yeah. I feel like they could have, there's so many things they could have done. This whole thing of James and Victoria, Victoria is a complete non-entity in this movie she's not even worth mentioning she's i think she sparks the events of the late the next movie yeah. uh, whatever that, that doesn't matter now in this case it's about james james is the most important thing we should have some sort of history between him and edward maybe this could have been a way like this whole thing with james could have been a way for us to learn more about bella and edward all we really learn is what we already know edward is very protective of her we don't learn how much edward is is driven or pushed to save Bella beyond him just resisting the urge to drink all her blood when she's captured by James at the end of the movie in one of the most, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most underwhelming climaxes of all time. <laughs> all it really ends up being is James captures her. He tricks her into coming to this her old ballet school. I don't know why that matters. <laughs> it's just, it's I think just, it was mentioned once before. Yeah, it's just insert location here. It doesn't matter. It's a room with a lot of mirrors. Anyway, he captures her. Edward just shows up has a brief fight with James, and James is is dispatched with... And that's it. One thing I guess that is important is James bites Bella, and so Edward has to suck all the venom out to save her because he doesn't want her to become a vampire. He wants her to remain a pristine virgin, (laughs) I guess, by the Mormon interpretation. The sacrifice is that 
Bella put herself in danger because she thought she was saving her mom because that's how she was lured. She thought her mom was abducted by James, but that wasn't the case. And and that's really it. I, I think there was an opportunity for maybe James to get the upper hand on Edward and Edward being willing to give up his life. And then, I don't know, Bella kind of gets up and does something. I don't know. So, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it was resolved so in such a straightforward, bland way. And it's a very small part of the ending yeah. of the film. It's yes. like the last like 25 two, minutes. Maybe. Even less, <laughs> even less, I think. Like the actual action part yeah. is like two minutes, maybe. You don't learn anything. Like James doesn't reveal anything about Edward that makes Bella question question Edward. Like maybe if they had a backstory, maybe James could have told her about something horrifying that Edward did. Like Edward told her that he'd killed people in the past, but that's kind of glossed over. She just, I think she literally says, I don't care. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> something strange that could be fixed in the movie. There's there's no nothing at stake other than them being together. There's never a time where she thinks that she shouldn't be with him. She's just constantly like, I don't care what you are. I don't care what you did. I still love you. When he's like confessing to murder. And <laughs> I know, I know. Maybe someone in Bella's family should have been actually abducted, like the father or the mother. And then Edward's allows one of her parents to die so he can save Bella and that's like a friction in the relationship I don't know you know what I mean like I'm just spitballing that something could have been done yeah. and that could have been used as a way of exploring the relationship instead it's just resolved very easily I think the intention of these movies and, and books maybe is they don't want to go into that kind of really complex moral territory. They 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 want them to love each other, and they want it, they want it to be like a pure yeah. I think that love. is the actual plot of the book is more or the movie as well. It's just romance that happens to have vampires in it. You know those soap operas like the daily ones, like the, the Pride <laughs> yeah. and Pride and Prejudice, not Pride and Prejudice. Sorry, the Bold and the Beautiful. Yeah. It's it's like they want to give people some drama, but they don't want it to be too intense or too dramatic yeah so uh, for for me it just ends up being very boring because what i love the most are like challenging movies that have challenging ideas and characters that go through a lot and it really changes them in this movie but we're at the end there's very little change in the main two characters you could say that edward opens up and lets a human in his life bella decides to take a bigger risk and have this person like this vampire be in her life like the human characters, we don't we don't learn anything. Uh, there's this big thing in the movie where supposedly a big thing where to protect her father, Bella lies to him, and she says the most hurtful thing because she knows James is tracking her and will probably try to get to the dad as well. So she just says the same thing that her mother said when she left her father. It's supposed to be this big deal, but we don't see the dad's reaction to it. She just leaves, and then in the end of the movie, when she's in the hospital recovering from her wounds from that from James's bite, if you remember this. She says, I need to talk to dad. I want to apologize. I don't know if he'll forgive me. We never see them talk about that in the rest of the movie. It's just all about Edward and like them going to prom. The dad's a non-entity. The Collins are all non-entities. Alice, she is nice to, <laughs> to Bella. There's one one of them was a Rosalie who doesn't like that there's yeah. a human amongst them for reasons we'll, we won't get into here, but, but are important for later movies. And Carlisle, who's the patriarch, is, is also nice. <laughs> that's it that's it and there's nothing else yeah i i think if i was watching this movie for the first time as an adult now i would not enjoy it would not it. have its impact no, right it, it's a, a lot of just like nostalgia i suspect yeah. that i suspect that's the case yeah i think people really enjoy it because it's comforting because I read it when I was yeah. a child. I read all the books when I was like between eight and nine. And I saw the movies between eight and 11 or whenever the last one came out. Mm -hmm. And now I'd be like, oh, that is a bad, bad movie, a bad yeah. book. But they're, they have like a hold on the people that originally liked them. The thing is, there's so many better things that are from that era preceding it and coming after it. The two examples I mentioned earlier, Buffy and True Blood, very, very similar, but vastly superior. I mean, True Blood, I stopped watching it at a certain point. It got worse. But in the beginning, so you have the human and played by Anna Paquin. I can't remember characters' names anymore. And then <laughs> she falls for this vampire. And the process of how the relationship develops is actually, I would say, very similar. Have you seen True Blood? No. I would highly recommend it to you. It won't be my recommendation for this episode, though, but it's m much more rich and nuanced. There's a love triangle in it, too. <laughs> it's it's just astounding to me that Twilight is the thing that is most well-known. I suppose the appeal of it is simplicity. A anybody from any culture can kind of 
just access it because it is so basic mm -hmm. and maybe that's the secret to its success because beyond that it's just there's nothing there it, it astounded me that the movie was two hours long the movie ends with edward and bella going to prom together and then we see victoria the, <laughs> such an important <laughs> character victoria looming watching them from a window plotting her revenge dun 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 because <laughs> She loved James because he, he had wrapped his arm around her at one point. <laughs> yeah. That's the extent of their relationship <laughs> in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and then there you have it. That's Twilight. End credits with Radiohead song randomly. <laughs> and, and then I think there's a Linkin Park song. It's just, there is a Linkin Park song. But the last thing I'll say before we just kind of cap off is just nothing stands out in this movie. It's, it's a kind of amazing. The music doesn't stand out. The setting doesn't stand out. Even when it's supposed to be something that's like beautiful or mind blowing, when like when he, when Edward takes her to the top of a tree and we see this view, it's like this murky, nondescript like forest and some some water. It's nothing special. Yet Twilight is one of the most popular movies of all time. So on to final judgments. I'll start with you, Emmy. Is Twilight fixable, fine just as it is, or damaged beyond repair? I would say it's fixable with some major fixing needed, but I think I'm a bit biased. I would say it's fixable in the sense that the premise isn't the greatest or the most interesting or unique or whatever, but it could have been much better and it could have been done in a way in which it would have been more accessible to people like me who don't naturally go for young adult stuff or romance. Beyond just adding more of a backstory for Bella and then maybe a little bit for Edward, maybe we could learn more about him later, but more backstory for all the other characters, like the villains or the other Collins, show, showing more relationships with people in this world. The movie could have fared better if it was saying something more than just these two people are in love and they want to be with each other. This is something that might not appeal to the Mormon creator of this franchise, there's something in the narration in the beginning of the movie. Bella basically says that I'd never given much thought to how I would die, but dying in the place of someone I love seems like a good way to go. Based on my understanding of the movie later on, she says that in the context of going to where James is luring her to save her mother. But I guess later on in the movies, it's, it's also for Edward. Maybe? Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. I was thinking maybe Bella has this pathological fear of death maybe she has this existential crisis before the events of the movie and so that's why she's depressed and she doesn't want to do anything with her life and nothing excites her in life she has no adventurous spirit and it all comes from this thing of like well i only live once and then we're dead and there's nothing there when she meets edward he is literally her gateway to finding this new exhilarating adventure in life and a life after death and because she finds this, she learns to not care about like care about dying so much. And when she stops caring about dying so much, she finally learns how to live. So it, it's kind of poetic in this way where having her life saved by Edward is the thing that finally opens her up. And then she realizes she doesn't have to fear death. Letting go of life by becoming a vampire will give her everything she wants. She only really lives when she lets go of the need to live, which is kind of like this enlightenment zen idea maybe you could work <laughs> through a mormon viewpoint as well <laughs> then there would actually be a lesson to the movie yeah what what is the lesson of the movie as it stands <laughs> i have no idea follow follow your love <laughs> yeah. follow blindly it. Follow, follow your heart follow, blindly follow your love which has this nice nice kind of purity to it i suppose but it doesn't really have much of an impact in in this way because there's nothing sacrificed for this love exactly yeah so yeah, I think it is fixable. Maybe we could have gone this Enlightenment Zen route, maybe, by changing uh, Bella's character. It wouldn't be very PG <laughs> if you have your main character just suicidal and in the beginning and like, hating She's life. kind of like that in the next movie. I, I suppose so, yeah. I, that's the thing. I do think, now that I'm like revisiting it, I, I, I thought that the first movie was the best one. It might be that it actually just isn't, and the, the better ones are the later ones that build on the nothingness that this first movie is. Yeah, I think there's much more plot to the rest of the movies. If there was word that they were going to make a movie based on this new book that shows things from Edward's perspective, would you watch it? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Sadly, what would that even yes. be? Oh my god. I don't even want to imagine what that travesty would be. Uh, that would probably be beyond fixing if they ever did make it. <laughs> And before we sign off, as always, we have a few recommendations for things we've been watching lately. 
Emmy, what's your recommendation? I actually have a book for a recommendation, and it's called Moon of the Crested Snow by Wabgishig Rice, who is a Canadian author. It is a dystopian post-apocalyptic book that's told from a native reserve in northern Ontario and how they're affected without quite realizing what's going on because of how far north they are and remote from the rest of the country. Um, I gave it five stars. On Goodreads? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what would you say stood out to you about the book? Like, why, why, is it, why would you say it's a must-read? I think that it being written by a native author, it shows a really different side of how people interact with each other and society. It's all set on the res and you meet the characters there and how they live their life. And it's set in modern day, but they have really spotty satellite signal up there. So nobody is like, they don't realize that the world is shutting down everywhere just because their phone loses signal. And they're like, oh, that happens all the time. It's just a funny way of experiencing the apocalypse. It's so interesting because I, I always felt that that whole genre of the post-apocalyptic dystopian world has been done to death. But this is, I don't think this has ever been done. No, it's really interesting. There's a few books that I've read that are like exactly this genre, like The Marrow Thieves is post-apocalyptic natives. Um, there's a movie, Blood Quantum. So there's this whole subgenre of it. Like, yeah, I just it's really heard. interesting. Yeah, okay, awesome. So my recommendation is not a book. It's a TV show <laughs> that is something that I actually grew up watching. It's ER. Are you familiar with ER? I've Have you ever watched it. it? I don't think I've ever watched it, unless it was just on. <laughs> so it's it's on Prime in Canada, if you're in Canada. It came out in the 90s, and I remember it was a big deal in the 90s. It was one of those TV shows that uh, that it's considered groundbreaking and changed television, and like how graphic and intense it was. It, it, it's pretty simple. It just follows the lives of doctors and nurses who work in an ER department in Chicago. And I was just blown away by the, the sheer intricacy of showing all of the challenges that having that kind of life for a doctor would have beyond just the long hours and the stressful work it's just you're interacting with all these people at their worst possible moments and their lives are in your hands and you see them in all these extremes and then you're supposed to just you know go on your break and go home and the cast is excellent like George Clooney actually got his first big break I think in the show I think it's what the thing that catapulted him to start him. I've heard that yeah yeah he's great in it and pretty much all the main cast are amazing they're all going through their own different challenges they're all different personalities there's huge stakes for them in their personal lives and just for the lives of their patients that they're dealing with and I remember there was this one episode that I saw the other day that I thought was great where it's just this woman who comes in with this routine pregnancy and everything that could go wrong goes wrong and the normally unflappable head resident of the ER department goes from handling it very well to the very end where she's like just dead she's flatlined and he's just pushing down on her heart and it's just this exhausting emotional journey that you're going through with them as a viewer and I thought it was amazing I had this realization that all those other shows medical shows that came after it are just in a sense <laughs> hollow remakes of ER they're copying the formula but they don't have the same heart or uh, complexity as ER does so I would lump in something like Grey's Anatomy there <laughs> I only mention that because Emmy's a big fan <laughs> <laughs> but but you you would agree that Grey's Anatomy is for the most part not good. Oh yeah, I yeah. watched it because everybody else watched it, yeah. and then I just had to keep watching. It. Anyway, for people who liked Grey's Anatomy and and medical dramas like that, I'd say go back to the source. I mean, I'm sure there were medical dramas before, but I think the one that really changed it into you know very grounded into reality world is ER. Start with the first season. I don't know how the rest of the show goes, but the first season is excellent. Five stars? Five stars. <laughs> and that's our episode. Thank you so much for listening to our Twilight special. <laughs> I never thought I'd do an episode on Twilight of all things, Are you glad but Emmy did? convinced me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually learned a lot about the Twilight world and about other things. Uh, maybe the movie was meant as Mormon propaganda. <laughs> there are some suspicious things about it. But yeah, thank you so much again for listening. And thank you, Emmy. I hope you come join me for another episode soon. Hopefully new not moon. one Twilight. <laughs> no, no new moon. No new moon. All right. And we'll be back with an episode soon. Bye. Bye.
better hold on tight, spider monkey.